Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you and welcome to the latest in our series of Doha debates coming to you from the Gulf state of Qatar and sponsored by the Qatar Foundation. We all know that money and politics go hand in hand, but in many parts of the world, people are told they have only one choice. Take the money, but stay out of politics. That message has gone out to millions in China, Russia, and here in the Middle East, that you can be free to make your fortune, but don't expect anything much in the way of democracy. It's the subject of our debate tonight and the motion before us. This House would prefer money to free elections. Well, the two sides of our panel disagree fundamentally on this issue. Speaking for the motion, Dr. N. Jan Hardan, political analyst based in the UAE and a former editor of Gulf in the media. And with him, Jean-Francois Sesnek, who's both academic and businessman, a visiting associate professor at Georgetown University's Center for Contemporary Arab Studies in Washington. Against the motion, Mani Shankar Ayer, former Indian government minister, outspoken commentator and MP, and now honorary fellow at Cambridge University. And with him, Wael Abbas, well known in this region as a political blogger, democracy advocate, and journalist. A native Egyptian, he's often been critical of his government and its human rights record. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. So now let me ask Narayan Appa Jahardan to speak for the motion, please. Thank you, Tim, and uh, hello, everyone. I begin my arguments in favor of the motion with an admission. I'm taking, uh, making my case as an ordinary and practical person, not as an intellectual. This distinction is important because very few intellectuals would trade their freedom for money. So put aside your intellectual hats and wear on your common man's caps. I also want to frame my arguments by widening the canvas to a larger question. Which is more important, political reforms or economic reforms? The world has always been a place where economic sense is viewed as common sense. Money which represents food, shelter, clothing, and dignified life is certainly more important than the political system for most ordinary people. And majority of the people in this world are ordinary. An example that establishes my point that economy drives politics is the recent US elections. The reason for the Democrats' loss was not because Obama is black or Muslim. It was triggered by news of 15 million Americans being unemployed. Will another round of free elections solve the crisis? No. To borrow Clinton's slogan, it's the economy, stupid. People want more money, more jobs, more benefits. So free elections is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Whereas money can be both the means and the end. This is why more than 80% of citizens in most of the Gulf countries expect, express strong satisfaction with the way they live, even without significant political power. Will political reform take away their money? Maybe. These countries point to the chaos, lack of growth, and divisiveness that elections have brought about in Kuwait, Iraq, Lebanon, Palestine, Bahrain, to name a few. The question then is, can economic reforms take place without political reforms? Yes, it is only in the American experience that democracy and capitalism develop simultaneously. In Europe, capitalism came before democracy. In the Arab world, the current unemployment rate is about 20%. 80% of this figure constitutes youth. Could you come to a More than half of them prefer migrating abroad, not to countries where free elections are practiced, but to any place where they can get a job, money, and decent livelihood. Someone once said it's hard to even preach to an empty stomach. Finally, while money is a necessity, free elections are a luxury. It is like the sixth sense that makes it possible to enjoy the other five. Thank you. Narayana Pajahadan. Thank you very much indeed. So you just take the money and run then. That's all you're interested in. No development in society, no community development. Just take, well, the, money, all, take the money and run. Well, all that comes only if there is enough money that is put into the society, right? I mean, what is the point and of And what guarantees that you can keep your money when you've got it? Well, I mean, that's, people devise enough ways. Uh, I think once you become economically empowered... Well, they put empowered, it under their mattress, do no, they? Is that once, the once you become economically empowered, you also become politically empowered. It also brings that's about some kind of That's what they thought in Russia, didn't they? That's what the uh, oligarchs thought in Russia. Oh, well, I they're mean, hugely rich, and what do they find now? Well, they're people, raided, they're pursued, they're mown down, they're put in jail for years. 
What did their money do to well, protect them? I, I think those of them, this is a modern age where people have a fair semblance of uh, what but freedom destroys, is all about. It destroys your, ar Economic it destroys power brings your argument you political completely. Power. The yeah. money does not protect them from their own government, I mean, it does it? It does, to a large extent. I mean, people don't have any protection but it hasn't, at all. has it? Look so, at the facts. Oh, no. How many of them have been put in jail? Who well, said it? The I largest mean, businessman and most important I'm sure businessman more people, in Russia More people are in jail today who are poor than those who are rich. You think so? I think so. And you think the money protects you? Well, to a certain extent. At least more than protection, it at least gives you a chance to and survive. And you, you have nothing to say. You'd rather people told you how to live your life. You'd rather be told what you can read, what you can say. Well, the whole point is if I don't survive of what use is freedom. And I think only money helps me survive. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Mani Shankar, would you like to speak against the motion, please? Well, as a member of parliament, I've fought six free elections, and I know that you can't fight free elections without money. The fact of the matter is that almost all countries which have a high per capita income are countries which hold free elections, and almost all countries which have a low per capita income are those that don't hold free elections. There doesn't seem to be any guarantee that even prosperity under a dictatorship can be sustained. For the Soviet Union underwent the fastest rate of growth ever under Stalin in the 1930s, and today the Soviet Union is history, whereas the United States, for example, which has been through several crises in, its, in the last 220 years or so, has survived them because democracy throws up answers which dictatorships attempt to suppress. In the case of India, we didn't have free elections until we became independent, and our rate of growth was 0.72% per annum. Since independence, we've had a series of free elections, 15, 15 for the center itself, and our rate of growth has gone up to over 9%. Um, it is true that China has uh, demonstrated remarkable rates of growth without free elections, but you can see the simmering anger. According to one estimate, there were about 70,000 demonstrations against the rulers in China over the course of the last year. And the emphasis now being placed by them on harmony is an indication of how the kettle is boiling and the lid is jumping. And so long as the steam is allowed to go out, as happens in a democracy, you'll be able to keep the pot boiling. But if you don't, then there'll be an explosion. An explosion that is taking place in countries, for example, like Iran, where the prosperity under the Shah was unprecedented. And yet, were people happy? No. They overthrew that regime. It's possible that they are still not very happy. But I'm certain that the more Iran democratizes, the more prosperity is likely to grow. Could you I come had to a close, please? Pardon? Could you come to a close, please? Yes, so there I would come to the basic conclusion that, in fact, it is free elections that promote prosperity and sustain prosperity. You can have prosperity without free elections, but that is not a mixture that can be sustained over any very considerable period of time. All right, Mani Shankar, Aya, thank you very much. You talk about simmering anger in China, but look at the simmering anger in India. You're fighting insurgency in a third of your districts now. That's, that's why... You have 900 million people in the gutter who haven't benefited much from free elections, have they? True, but 300 million have. <laughs> and that's, that's approximately five and times three, the size three, of the population yeah, of your country. but three times that number or without basic entitlements. And I they're think, fed up with it. They're not going to like that. I think quiet. the basic reason it. why there's so much discontent at the bottom is that we don't have enough democracy at the bottom. It's not by denying democracy to those at the bottom of the economic and social ladder. But it's ladder. the poor who vote. The poor who vote in huge no, numbers the, in India, don't the, they? It is because of the vote that we've had a major change in our constitution 20 years ago. And today we have have as many as 3 million elected representatives at the grassroots. Now, to the extent to which higher echelons of our democracy are willing to empower them at the grassroots, that we're going to contain this anger. But if we attempt to contain this anger by denying even free elections, I'm afraid the whole pot is going to blow up. But the only people who take any, in the, any notice of, uh, who get any notice taken of them are the rich. I mean, the government, no, that's doesn't, complete the government doesn't bother with the poor. It's complete nonsense. The government nonsense. holds the door open it's for the rich, doesn't sorry, it? Sorry, Tim, that's complete nonsense because the fact
fact is that in India, the poor are the ones who vote, the rich do not go to vote. And these poor have determined I'm not talking that they're about going to I'm repeatedly about change the government. Sorry? Influence is something else. Pardon? I'm not talking about whether the rich vote. I'm talking about their influence. They're the ones who get things done, the big corporations. They're the ones that governments listen to, your government listens to. Not they, the poor, not the people who voted. There's simply no doubt that there is a tendency for government to be captured by the classes. But every five years, by the, the masses... Riches get the opportunity to say out with you. That's why we've had 10 governments in the last 20 years. All right, Manishanka Aya, thank you very much indeed. Now, please. <laughs> Let me ask Jean-Francois Sesnek to speak for the motion, please. Well, this motion is really a choice between wealth and democracy today. And uh, my remarks are really uh, tailored for the Gulf because I know the Gulf a little better than many other places. But uh, I'm not against democracy. I like democracy warts and all. It works in the US where I live. But the democracy cannot be imposed from outside. It must naturally come within or else it creates havoc. I mean, the Gulf states are basically enlightened autocracies today, but they create stability and wealth by using their God-given oil, gas, and industrial power. Democracy in the Gulf today would guarantee instability and poverty by bringing extremist groups to power. In fact, wealth can only happen through stability. Of course, the enlightened rulers are not perfect. There are many issues of financial abuse and human rights, but by and large, many of these concerns are known and some are addressed albeit not fast enough. But the present rulers are really bringing to the Gulf, they are bringing the Gulf into the, first, the 21st century against the wish of strong and organized conservative elements. The rulers are increasing participation slowly through Majlis as Shuras and so on, but they're not liberalizing at all. Most important, perhaps, I think, is that they are providing a vision to their countries and their citizens to become leaders of the world and the economic center of the Silk Route. I think their vision requires stability to create wealth, but also requires and promotes education and creativity among all the citizens of the countries, men and women. Ultimately, this will lead to a diverse and rich civil society which then will translate into free elections, but not before. If we had democracy today, it would not bring the power to the people, by the people, for the people. It would bring the power of the extremists against the people and for the extremists. Jean-Francois Sesnek, thank you very much indeed. Where, where is the encouragement to people in the Gulf to become leaders of the world when they can't even become leaders at home? I think there are many forms of leadership, uh, and I think one of the ones we see well, name, today, name, name me one. Well, industrial power, I think these countries are becoming, in the region, are becoming among the leaders in the chemical industry, in the aluminum industry. And who owns them? Who owns them? The they're, not in, they're not in private hands, they're in the state's hands. Some of them are in private hands, especially in Saudi Arabia, but most of them Very are little. in most of that are in state. So the state takes the money and the state decides what you can read, what you can say, and what participation you may or may not have. I'm not sure I agree with, the, with that in the sense that the state is run in a lot of places by the civil servants and the civil servants are not always uh, uh, working very closely with their families. And who are, they, who are they answerable to? They're not answerable to the people out there. If there's corruption, they're not taken to a, held accountable by the people. Uh, they may or may not be held well, accountable by the rulers, but often not, apparently. I, I think the regimes in this region have been in power for almost 250 years, except for a few other end times, and they have developed systems to really listen to the people. The advantage there is in this region... Like is they listen to the migrant workers in Dubai, for instance, or well, elsewhere in the Gulf, and the kinds of conditions that they've suffered. I'm afraid you're absolutely right. They are, they are not listening to the foreign problem. If I had to put one of the big problems of the region is the fact that you have 16 million foreign workers versus 20 million locals. 
And that is Farm a big workers problem. who have very few rights. They have very few rights. I'm talking about the demo if you had a democracy here with votes, the votes would only apply to the local people in any event. Don't you ever think how much better this region might be doing if it was democratic? You talk about the gains and the, yes, and the th progress it's made. I, I think it Maybe would the gains be would have been much more. It would, I, I doubt democracy. it very much because the people who have the ability today to get elected in free elections are not necessarily people that would commit to have a long-term freedom for everybody. In but fact, at least you can get them out once they're in. That's the advantage, isn't it? You can you, get them you, out. You hope that's the case. Yes. Jean-Francois Seznick, thank you very much indeed. Now could I ask please Wael Abbas to speak against the motion? Yeah. Um, um, this might sound a little bit cliche, but I'm on this side basically because I believe that uh, democracy is a basic human right and a basic human need, whether the person knows that or not. Uh, I can't trust no leader, no matter how wise he might be, because I cannot say she might be, uh, with taking decisions that will affect my life and the future of my children. We've seen leaders of rich and powerful countries leading them to war and ending empires in ruins. 50% of the population of some countries who are very rich and can afford to buy luxurious, fast sports car are not allowed to drive these cars. On a more serious note, there are countries where a great percentage of the population don't have a nationality. And despite the fact that they have a lot of money, they cannot even leave the country and travel abroad. Uh, money, in my opinion, goes well with dictatorship. You can easily buy a newspaper and kick out its editor-in-chief, like, just like what happened in Egypt recently. Uh, the only time that I saw money work in harmony with elections was when candidates bribe voters with cash or one kilo of rice. Thank you. Well, Abbas, thank you very much indeed. What would free elections do for you in Egypt? Same as in India, create a generation, new generation of haves and have-nots, more have-nots than haves? No, it's my, in, uh, I believe that it will enable people who had no voice before to participate in the decision-making process, which the most important They'd thing They have a voice, opinion. but it doesn't mean they're going to participate in the decision-making process, does it? They will if we let them, if we enlighten them about it, if we allow the media to work freely, if uh, we allow the civil society to work freely and to have access to people, which is not the case in Egypt, in Egypt at the moment. It doesn't happen in lots of countries. I mean, you look at the United States, it's only the people with money that get listened to. You go and knock on the door of your congressman and senator, and the first question they ask you is, are you a contributor? If you're not, Forget it. That's your access to democracy. We have new Is that better? We have new tools at the moment. We have new tools, like we have the internet. We have people who were nobodies, and nobody heard of them before, and now they are speaking out on the internet. They have blogs, they have Facebook. Speaking out and having no influence whatsoever. They have. It's cacophony. Have. What, it, is it, the, it, what is the influence? Tell me. In my country, we were able, for example, to expose torture at police stations, and we were able to take some officers for the first time in our history, our recent history, uh, to, to court and send them to jail. We were able to expose sexual harassment. We were able it to talk about... It doesn't change the government, though, does it? It doesn't, but it puts pressure on it, and it, 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 it enlightens people who are on the ru long run who are going to take action against this government and change it. And again, whichever state you're in, it's the people with money who are going to be the people who have influence, isn't it? Whether you have free elections or not, there's no getting away from that. It's money that buys you options and freedoms. It is, it is, but... W once you have influence... So you're on the wrong side of the debate. You should be <laughs> on that side. No. <laughs> huh? uh, it is in a sense, but uh, it's about... The, the problem is about reaching people and changing their mindset, changing the way that they look at things. W when people are encouraged to take action and to uh, work against this, this situation, it will be changed. Because it, it is like that, like what you say at the moment. But when we work on it, it will change. All right, Wael Abbas, thank you very much indeed. We're going to throw the question open, the motion open to the audience now. This House would prefer money to free elections. There's a gentleman in the first row. Take your question, please. We'll get a microphone to you. Good evening. My question is to Could Mr. you tell Hass us where you're from, please? Uh, my name is Rashid al -Manadi. I'm from Qatar. My question is to Mr. Francois. You said that oil brought us wealth. And wealth brought us prosperity, right? So what will happen when the oil finishes in the next 70 years? All hell breaks, uh, breaks, breaks loose? 
Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a most important point, and I think the, the leaderships and the, uh, I think the people as a whole are very much aware of this, as you are aware of it. Uh, the oil will come to an end. Gas, even in Qatar, will come to an end sooner or later. It might take two or three generations, but it'll be there. I think there's a major effort to change the economies very, very quickly into value-added economies, and well, as the king of Saudi Arabia says, uh, knowledge-based economies in order not to depend on oil anymore. Whether it will be successful, I don't know, but uh, a very large percentage of the GDP is already going into this kind of industries. So, uh, yes, I think in the long run, the, uh, the, the Gulf, if it pursues the policies it is pursuing now, will succeed into moving away from oil. Do you believe that? No. No. What do you believe? That, well, you, that you need some democracy to cement? Well, the no, gains? I think that we need more, uh, yes, more democracy to provide more. Uh, you know, more space for human development. Because what I'm seeing now, I, I currently work in Ras Gas Company, and what I'm seeing that all what we're doing are just more production of our gas. A few days ago, we celebrated that now Qatar produced 77 million tons of natural gas a year. So what we're doing is just depleting our gas reserve. I'm not using it for something good. We're not producing anything. We're just selling gas. And democracy and free elections, you in favor of those? Yes. Now? Now. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lady in the front row. If you want a, gen a new generation to learn how to be, uh, to learn democracy and, uh, and the basic um, and the basics of democracy. How would you how would you imagine they would learn if they don't have the time, the, 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 the right the, to express themselves freely? I, I don't. I fully understand what you're, where you're coming from on this. But the fact is, today, if you had really open mics, so to speak, in society in the region, you would have the Islamists take over. And I'm not sure that would keep you, in particular, able to speak. No, sir. What you're saying is that. Uh, if we open democracy and if we allow democracy in, in, specific, re in specific countries, we, uh, people are going to be bullied by some, uh, yes. by some... But then that's not the case. And if I'm not going to be bullied by someone, and if I, if I, then I won't be able to bully that someone and tell them that, no, what you're saying yes. is wrong, what I'm saying is right, and I, this is my point of view. I, I wish, I wish you fight, were right. I wish that you were fight, right. That fight, that fight, that unstable... Can, can we let country. him answer? Sorry. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I, I fully... I, I I fully appreciate what, what this uh, la the lady is saying, but the fact is the elections in Kuwait tend to always produce the Islamists in power. The elections in Bahrain four years ago had 80% Islamists in power, and all they were talking about is Islamist issues and not the issues of the people. Even in Saudi Arabia, God forbid, there was elections a few, a few years ago, and the, the, uh, the golden list, I think it was called, passed. And that was really not democracy. And I'm afraid that if So we God forbid that democracy produces a result that you don't like. Well, that's, that's exactly the point today. And I think we have an issue with that. Well, on, the other hand, on the other hand, you have a country like Pakistan, created on the basis of religion. And yet every democratic election, the Islamists have never got more than 3%. So the argument that if you have democracy in a Muslim country, only the extreme Islamists will come in is a completely wrong argument. You, ha you allow democracy and the chances are that people will get elected who are dealing with the real problems of the people and not with false problems of doctrine. This is the case if you have a civil society, a very active civil society that exists in Pakistan just as it was existing in India. Uh, before partition and so on. You have an enormous ability of the civil society to exist. In the Gulf, we have not had this so far. These two have just shown that it does exist if you'll give it a chance. Yeah, well. This young man, that young lady, I, I wish they were Indians. How, how, <laughs> Gentlemen in the second row, please. Good evening, I'm a Qatari national, and my question goes out to uh, either panel. The question is, does democracy add value if it's there for the sake of it? Uh, taking Qatar, for example, uh, every other day we see uh, press releases of Qatar climbing uh, positions in international uh, ratings, whether it be competitiveness or transparency. So again, 
what would democracy bring to Qatar now as opposed to 70 years? Well, I think uh, the, the problem is not about uh, you know, whether democracy comes to the region now or later. The problem is whether the conditions are right or not. And I strongly believe that the conditions are not yet right. I mean, democracy should be something that grows from below. It should not be a top-down approach. Essentially, now what we see in terms of political reforms in the region is reforms from above. Until you have a certain political culture in the region, there is a, certainly a lack of political awareness. Just the fact that two young people here would uh, demand democracy in the region doesn't necessarily mean that everybody else is ready, everybody else is politically aware of what they require. So far, it has been a completely patron-client kind of relationship in the region. People have got used to a certain standard of living, a certain welfare mechanism, which is not always true in all the other developed countries or democracies. So I think there needs to be a certain amount of political culture that needs to be developed. And I think the, the beginnings of that political culture is being seen in terms of the whole lot of knowledge economy that's being based. Education is the most important thing. I mean, as you move on, you will have a situation where things will develop, where there will be some amount amount of discontent, dissatisfaction among the people because of uh, uh, growth in population, because of you seem to growing be promoting a, You seem to be promoting a nanny state here. We'll tell you no, when you're no, right. I mean, we'll course. tell you when you're ready. It will. It will um, be. Somebody mean, else will tell well, you. You're well, not right yet, but you can have no, it in a couple of weeks or well, a couple well, of years. Well, democracy or... didn't come first in Europe. Capitalism came in first. I mean, there was a ground that was prepared for democracy to come into most part of the world except in America, where both came I, about I, simultaneously. I'm, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid your history is wrong. The democracy came to the United States while the white people there were stealing somebody else's, somebody else's land, killing all those who were resisting the taking over that land, and enslaving another continent in order to promote their development. But they did talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not the pursuit of billions of rials in their constitution. And it is equally true that liberté, fraternité, égalité came in a country that was extremely backward at that time. So democracy itself promotes prosperity. It's not the other way around. And I do not think this, uh, this colonial argument of creating a culture is a valid one. For after all, what, it, what Britain took a thousand years to arrive at, India started on the first day that we became independent. We were told that we couldn't have universal suffrage. We were told that a country which is divided on the basis of caste cannot possibly promote any ideas of equality. But we totally dismantled feudalism. We have succeeded in bringing millions, tens of millions of people into the middle class, onto the prosperity, prosperity trajectory. And it's only if we persist with this that others will come on. But if we were to say that the best thing now is to close down our democracy so that we can become like China, well, you're welcome to go to China. I'd rather remain well, I, in I, India. I think, I think one of the problems is which we have forgotten when we talk about history is that most of these democracies came out of bloodbath where people killed each other for years and years and years. Even in the United States, there was a revolutionary war, which was not pleasant. French Revolution came out of a, the most amazing violence. And if democracy, if the only way to get democracy is through violence, this is really a big problem. I think that what the advantage of the Gulf today is that they can move slowly because they have the wealth to do that. I want to go back to the question and ask him whether, I don't think anybody really answered your question <laughs> about what it would do for Qatar, did they? No, not what, really. what do you think it would do for Qatar? Well, democracy. I think, I, I think I, 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 the reason I ask is because I'm sitting halfway between both sides. I do think that the the, the it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Yeah, yes, it is. But the, the, the point being that, uh, yes, so long as you are moving in the right direction is not uh, the point. The point is ensuring sustainability. However, you can't ensure sustainability unless you have a strong government that can create a strong middle class. So nobody's really uh, tackled that issue yet. Well, there's a price to pay for democracy, where, and, and, and I'm sure it's easy to say, yes, we will pay that price for democracy, but I'm not sure that the people in the region are yet ready to pay that price, because well, the democracy a, a, doesn't a come... Price to pay for democracy? Of course, there is a price to pay for democracy, but um, uh, people should be giving uh, um, awareness first uh, before they are giving democracy, and this awareness should be... Uh, through freeing, making breakthroughs in the media and in the civil society and uh, 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 enlightening people about 
the values of freedom and democracy and stuff like that. So people will start embracing and understanding that democracy is going to help them. All right, I'm going to take a question from the lady up there. And, uh, yes, you. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Sudan, and my question is directed to the proposition. I just want to point out that I believe that in the Gulf, which is your primary example, it might not be a, as great as an issue because people are living comfortably, and that is like someone pointed out because of the wealth of oil. What happens when that runs out, when problems that were hidden, social problems and political problems come to light, when that economic prosperity no, no longer dominates, then what happens? Well, more, more I try to... Well, the more, the more I try to argue here, I would be sounding like a materialistic, you know, but, uh, but that's not the point. The point is... It's the side you're on. Oh, no, the, the, the point is that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you have to have necessary conditions on the ground for you to, you know, promote political change. And I think economic uh, prosperity brings about those conditions to a large extent. I mean, I think it's far more easier to cushion any kind of political change once you've had economic reforms, once you have a prosperous society to a large extent, then you can bring about political change. And, and you know, there have been voices raised about what happens when you run out of oil. And that's exactly, I mean, I think in the last 10 years, you've seen that the Gulf countries have brought about a host of diversification policies in their economic uh, issues. I mean, they're going about, today, I think roughly about 30% of uh, GDP is from non-oil uh, resources. I mean, so that's, Okay. Definitely going to progressively grow in the years ahead. Manishanka Aya, you don't look convinced by any of this. I'm totally unconvinced because while he talks about the price for paying for democracy, what about the price you pay for prosperity without democracy? You, uh, it was Jean-Francois who suggested just now that the Saudis want a knowledge-based economy. If they get a knowledge-based economy, then people are going to demand on the basis of that knowledge yes. that there be a major political change. Yes. We, now, we agree with that. Now therefore, now, therefore, if you gave them that political opportunity now, the change would come without violence. But if there's going to be resistance from the oil classes to the, to the knowledge classes, then there's going to be a lot of trouble. And it is not democracy is the great safety valve. You give it. We've seen that democracy operates in very poor countries. It also operates in very rich countries. But I've never seen the dictatorship lasting, whether in a prosperous country or a weak one. I mean, uh, you can have dictatorship itself does not ensure either prosperity or, po or poverty. Where, when you actually, get Germany getting rich under Hitler, where does it go? It goes into war. Let him come back from but, but this is not. You're saying the choice is either democracy or dictatorship. This is, we're not in dictatorships per se here. I called it in my uh, statement at first, enlightened autocracies, and this is what it is. The, the people have, for the last 250 years around here have been ruling almost by consensus, and it takes an awful long time to get any decisions, but decisions sometimes get made. So it's not totally uh, an absolute dictatorship as we have seen in many other places. Lady over there, thank you very much. Yes, you. Yeah. Um, the Where are you from, please? Oh, sorry, I'm Iraqi. Okay. The uh, issue of uh, switching to a knowledge-based society came up, and I just wonder, how do you expect that change to come about when there's no incentive to access knowledge, to gain knowledge, because of the wealth? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the whole point of trying to develop a knowledge-based society is here. Is, is for the reason that the gentleman mentioned, that in the years ahead, you're bound to have a situation where you may run out of oil, you may, uh, you may have a situation where there are a lot of unemployed people here. You don't want to rely on expatriates all the time. So you want to create another economy which is not purely oil-based. And that's the reason why they're developing a knowledge-based economy. Gentleman over there, you, sir. Good evening. Um, Hamad from Yemen. Uh, my question is for the opposition. Uh, what good is a free election when you, as an example, participate in the policy making process, feel very good about yourself, but later the government does not perform as well as expected economically or financially. And, uh, and so, for the rest of the year, you're broke. No, no, no. You have another election then. Yeah, it, exactly. The, the, the whole that, point of democracy show. is that if they don't perform, you kick them out. See, the lovely thing about democracy is that you don't respect your leaders. A democracy is an area where the politicians position socially 
is just below that of the dacoit or the prostitute. We are, we politicians are regarded as awful. And that's the great thing about democracy. You're, you're talking yourself out of any future job here. <laughs> I'm out of a job at the moment, so it's all right. <laughs> Come back I'm on sorry, that. but I, I do respect my politicians because I would not elect them in the office to represent me if I don't. You but I'm that? saying, uh, just, just like that, you know, some, some, sometimes uh, we don't know what the government is going to do before we elect them. And when we do, they might do a good job, they might not. So yeah, I'd rather, you know, be very sure about it, have, you know, a good econo economy, uh, just live a good life, and, and uh, whatever happens, happens later. But that's why Winston Churchill said democracy is a very bad form of government, but it's better than any other form of government. There is no guarantee that an election will produce a good result, but it will produce a result which can be changed. Whereas if you don't have elections, you may have to live with whatever the system is indefinitely, however long it harms you. That is, that, is assuming, that is assuming that you have sides which will play fair to a certain extent. I mean, there's not really great fairness in politics, but if you have sides that come into power and then refuses, refuse to leave or start oppressing the other groups, that you have a major problem. I mean, what do we have it seen? in have that system and institutions and a constitution that control that, it's not about playing fair, because if you're not playing fair, you'll be exposed and you'll destroy your own credibility because the system will expose you. And there are hundreds of constitutions that are violated day in, day out, and even in this area. So uh, I don't trust that too much. But you have the mechanism to fix them within them. There is a system inside them that fix them automatically whenever they are violated. They are not played with, yes. But you know, the only answer to a free election which produces a bad result is another free election. And if you don't have that free election, it means that there's not a system of free election. So a system of free elections is not only good for people, it's also good for prosperity. All right, I'm going to move on to a question from the lady in the second row, please. Hi, my name is Noor. I'm from the United States. Um, do you think democracy is feasible, sustainable, and beneficial if it leads to the withdrawal of foreign support, especially monetary foreign support? Democracy is feasible wherever the mind is free. And the mind is free everywhere. I don't think the mind becomes less free or more free depending upon circumstance, the mind is free and it chooses. I don't think I'd, I'd be very surprised if a foreign influence can overthrow where I stand. Gandhi said, Mahatma Gandhi said, that I want all the doors and the windows of my house to be open so that the winds of the world can blow about inside it, but I refuse to be swept off my feet. So in that sense, every society is always ready for democracy. And almost no society ever actually wants autocracy except for the autocrats who rule that society. That is why democracy is going to eventually prevail everywhere. And it will prevail whether it is a prosperous growing country or whether it is a stagnant poor country. Democracy will win in the end. jean Francois says that. I, I think... I think these are wonderful words. They really are beautiful words. But unfortunately, I really don't see this happening in this region anyway. I mean, look, we were talking about Iraq a bit earlier. We see that uh, the, uh, the, the events from overseas, from everywhere, and internally, are only creating havoc in Iraq. The, 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 the groups cannot work together because it happened too suddenly. So when we say that democracy can, and I really mean that when democracy comes up organic, organically from inside, I think that's what we're looking for. If we're bringing it from outside, then it explodes. You know, I lived in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. It was a very ordered society, but it was a very oppressed one. Very. Today, there is an element of democracy in Iraq and although the results of that last election are still really to coalesce into a government, 
The fact of the matter is that the people of Iraq have an opportunity to determine their own destiny instead of just leaving it to the Ba'ath Party to do With it. Mani we're, we're speaking on a day when 14 roadside bombs, 14 roadside bombs went off in Baghdad this morning. And in Saddam's day, you don't know how many people were killed because that information was not made available. Yes, yes but not, there a, not is, a comparable yeah, number. But, sure, is, not but a look, comparable number. that democracy has been brought about as a result of the invasion of Iraq. That invasion was wrong. But the invasion being now a part of history, there is a growing democracy. I would rather that there be a growing democracy there than a growing autocracy. But, but that growing autocracy suppressed freedom. But the opposite could take place in Iraq. You could have, this, since it's really not working and everybody's at loggerheads in Iraq, you could really have one party starts oppressing totally the others and go back to the old days of Saddam Hussein under another name. It's already May, happened. I, eight, eight months after the last election was held and uh, results were announced, they still don't have a government in Iraq. I want to go back to the question and ask you, you seem troubled by the idea of democracy. What, what, what worries you? Well, I mean, if we're going to take the example of Iraq, you know, the security forces are funded by, you know, from Western money. Um, much of, of the civil society groups infrastructure in Iraq is funded from foreign money. So, I mean, there is that monetary element that you need some sort of money, you need the resources to fund civil society groups to allow them to thrive. And I'm just not sure that if, if the West or, you know, whatever foreign country withdraws its, its support of certain institutions, how democracy can thrive. I mean, of course, the, the idea of democracy is very strong, but without the practical, you know, money or whatever it takes, you really can't have but it. The most expensive elections in the world are held in the United States of America. The fact of the matter is that democracy is expensive and money is used in democracies. But I don't think it delegitimizes the process because people need money to carry out their message. Ask any advertising executive. Uh, there is a problem with the civil society in our region because it has been giving a bad name for a long time, whether the dictatorships were uh, military regimes or monarchies. They have been always looked upon, they have been banned for a long time. And then when they were allowed to work again, they were looked upon as agents of the West. They are here to change our culture. They are here to work against our religion. They are, uh, wa want us to uh, accept the homosexuals, to give more rights to women and stuff like that. So the uh, uh, people in general don't think highly of the civil society in Egypt so that they will, they will not participate, they will not donate money. That's why uh, civil society in our region at the moment needs money from Europe and from the States and from other places. Um, gentlemen behind you. To, to the left there. Yes, you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, I come from Lebanon. Uh, I've been living in the Gulf for the past 11 years. Who dictates uh, what's free elections? Who dictates what's democracy? I believe that the people themselves are the ones who decide wh what is democracy. There should be a referendum and everybody in the country uh, should be involved. Wh when we are trying to uh, impose a constitution on the people, they should have a say in this constitution. So that's what decides how democracy is going to run this country afterwards, how the future of this country is going to be. But while uh, you know very well that unfortunately we're talking about a generation that's been brainwashed over exactly. a long that's, period that's why of time. We need, that's why we need free media. That's why we need an active civil society. That's when, why we need real political parties that are not established by a permission from the regime, but real political parties that are established from the base. And that's why the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt are successful, because I, in, I believe, despite that I disagree with them, that they are the only legitimate political party in Egypt because it established itself. It didn't wait for the government to give them permission and a newspaper and a, a villa to start their uh, uh, headquarters. But you're talking about free media. The internet is the free media, isn't it? It is at the moment, but we are, t we are on the internet because we want to free the other media because the other media reaches more people. I cannot claim that, uh, that I reached the, the whole population of Egypt. I reached like 25% only. Do you, think, do you think free media will come anytime soon? And you're talking about newspapers, TV, radio. Do you think they will we come made, anytime we soon? We made some breakthroughs back in 2005, and we forced the regime to, to admit that there are torture that is taking place in police stations and that there are rigging in the elections. Why did you expose that on the internet? You didn't expose it. 
Neither newspapers nor TVs covered no, that. No, it was, it was published on... Uh, in, 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 one was newspaper, published. in one newspaper. No, 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 more, more, more. Uh, uh, let, let me tell you about this story about sexual harassment. It was first posted Re on, our, on our, our, our blogs, but two years later, the official newspaper in Egypt, Al-Ahram, admitted that there were incidents of sexual harassment, and in the parliament, they are discussing at the moment a law against sexual harassment, and it all started on the internet, on the blogs. Dr. Jan Hanna. Yeah, then my point is that, uh, you know, you've been trying, most people try to equate free elections with democracy. I don't think that's what it is. Free elections is just a part of democracy. Democracy re requires a host of other things, and as you mentioned, civil society, freedom of expression, empowerment of women, a host of things. Invariably, everybody assumes that democracy is just about free elections. And to arrive at those conditions where you have to have an ideal democracy is, is extremely difficult, and that's the point. It takes a whole lot of time before you can happen. get to there. And, and it's not easy. Till then, it's what do people do? People, people just dream about the purple ink or the, you know, the ballot boxes and the ballot papers and not have anything in their stomach. So that's the reason Your why... Your method is not going to help it because empowering businessmen is not going to help that reaching this stage. Right. Empowering businessmen will only empower them defending their interests only, but not the interest of the All general right. population. La ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the point of the proceedings. We're going to vote now on the motion that this House would prefer money to free elections. If you just take your voting machines, uh, if you want to vote for the motion, that's the side represented by those on my right, you press button one in a moment. If you want to vote against the motion, that's the side represented by those on my left, it's button two. Whichever button you want to press, would you do it now? You only have to press once. Here we are, there is the vote. There is the vote, 37% for the motion, 63% against. The motion has been resoundingly rejected. All I have to do now is to thank our eminent speakers. Thank you very much for coming. Many of you have come a long way. Thank you to you, the audience, for your questions. The Doha debates will be back again in a month's time. Till then, from all of us on the team, have a safe journey home. Good night. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.